Hi, welcome to our YouTube channel. We hope today's message is encouraging, helps you in your walk with Jesus, and that it really just speaks to you. If you'd like to help us move the mission forward, you can give um, through the link below, and we hope that you enjoy. Hey, what's happening in Mixed Church? So we had a little bit of a technical difficulty uh, yesterday uh, with our podcast recording. And so here I am on a Monday recording the message just for you because we love you and we appreciate the fact that you would spend time during your work week uh, tuning into the messages here at Mixed Church. And so this is for you. Uh, we are uh, not in a series. We're just working our way through uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, here we are in Beatitude number eight. But to set up our time, allow me to read through um, Matthew 5, 1 through 9. And then I'll give you my sermon title. We'll get rolling. Matthew 5, 1, 9. Seeing the crowds, he... Uh, he is Jesus. Jesus went up to the mountain, and when Jesus sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they uh, will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And here comes a brand new beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Today I want to talk to you about picking fights in the family business. Picking fights in the family business. I wonder if you could uh, finish this quote. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. One of the most famous quotes by uh, one of the best uh, fighters of all time, Muhammad Ali. Uh, last week, I was looking through a list of the greatest fighters of all time. Muhammad Ali was on there. Uh, fighters like Manny Pacquiao, uh, Mike Tyson, Anderson Silva, who I think is a UFC uh, fighter. Um, towards the top of the list, Sugar Ray Robinson. And I don't, I don't know if Sugar Ray Robinson should have been at the top of the list. I'm not all that into uh, fighting. Um, however, as I was looking at the list, um, one name that I was surprised I did not see on there, uh, who I think is one of the, the fiercest and uh, one of the fieriest, uh, uh, terrifying fighters of all time, was the name Caitlin Corradolo, uh, formerly known as Caitlin Worth, a.k.a. my older sister. You see, my, my sister, um, she probably didn't wind up on that, that list because that list was uh, composed of people who fought in, you know, official state-sanctioned fights, whereas my older sister, she was more of a backyard fighter. She was more of a, a, a in the back seat of my parents' Buick station wagon on the way home from church type fighter. Do you have an older sibling like that? We, uh, we fought uh, nearly nonstop when, when we were kids. Caitlin had this unique skill uh, set where she could just, she could look at you and start a fight. We, we were a perfect storm. On one hand, as a child, I had a horrible temper, horrible temper. On the other hand, Caitlin, she was just a horrible person. Uh, and, and she wouldn't deny that. Um, we are great friends now. We, have, we, we talk on a regular basis. Uh, celebrated my birthday last week. She got me Chick-fil-A uh, gift cards, you know, probably, uh, you know, in order to continue good standing with me, you know, with all the hurt that she caused me as a child. But we're, we're good now. But boy, did we fight when we were kids. There were so many occasions where we would be driving and I, you know, as a, a six-year-old, would be looking out the window, minding my own business, probably talking to God and asking him how he wanted to use me as a vessel of, for his love and kindness later on in my life. And then all of a sudden I would turn and look at Caitlin and she would just be sitting there with some weird, stupid facial expression on her face. And that was all it took to get under my skin and start a fight. I don't know if it is a spiritual gift or not, but my older sister, Caitlin, she had the gift of picking 
a fight. She knew how to pick a fight. And my question today is, do you? Do you know how to pick a fight? And if you do, what, what criteria do you use for which fights you pick? And you, you might be lost right now um, and, and wondering, did I get my scriptures mixed up last week as I, I was studying? Because here I am talking about picking fights and Matthew 5, 9 indicates that Jesus was clearly talking about making peace. And as everyone knows, making peace and picking fights couldn't be further apart. Because after all, peace is is void of any conflict. Peace is the absence of fighting. Is it? Or, big question today, does peace actually provide the framework for which fights we pick? Does peace actually create the criteria for, for what fights you engage in in your life. If you're uh, tuning in for the very first time uh, uh, into the Mixed Podcast, um, we've been slowly working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. This is the preamble to Jesus' most popular message called the Sermon on the Mount. And in each one of these Beatitudes, Jesus followed uh, the same pattern of issuing a blessing or pronouncing happiness to a specific characteristic that we are to embody as his followers. And then he included the results of having the embodied characteristic that he mentioned. Again, happy are those who admit their spiritual bankruptcy, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. Happy are those who mourn over their sin, for they will be comforted. Happy are those who are meek, for they will inherit the earth. Happy are those who hunger and thirst after God's right way of living, for they will be satisfied. Happy are those who are merciful, for they will receive mercy. Happy are those who have pure of heart, those who will one thing, whose hearts are purely devoted to God, for they will see God. It's important to point out that within the Beatitudes, there is really a progression of spiritual formation, which is to say that in order, um, the order that Jesus placed each Beatitude in is very significant because each Beatitude builds on the ones that came before it. For instance, if, if you struggle with uh, uh, beatitude number five, which is blessed are those who are merciful, if you struggle to be merciful, it might make sense to first rewind and see how you're doing with the previous four beatitudes. Because it'll be impossible to be merciful to others if you yourself have never mourned over your own mistakes. If you've never really come to grips with, with your own missteps and, and your own shortcomings and your own internal drive to mess things up, what, what we call sin. It'll be very difficult to develop an appetite for God's right way of living, his righteousness, if you have never admitted your need for him. If you've never admitted your spiritual bankruptcy, your desperation for his presence, it'll be a stretch to will one thing, to devote your heart to God, to commit to him if you are aloof to the role that his mercy has placed in your life. The reason why I'm pointing that out is and emphasizing the progression with the, within the Beatitudes is because um, it is especially pertinent to Beatitude number eight. Because in Beatitude number 8, Jesus, he, he laid out such a, a pointed application that it necessitates a clear understanding and acceptance of all seven Beatitudes that preceded it. In other words, one way of looking at the Beatitudes is that the first seven Beatitudes largely speak to our formation as members of God's family. They, they focus on who we are on the inside. They focus on what's happening within us. But in Beatitude number eight, Jesus turned a little bit and he spoke directly to what is supposed to flow out from within us into the world around us. Let's read it again, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. 
the more literal translation of the latter end of this verse is, is how I read it um, at the beginning of the message where it says they will be called sons of God. Because um, whereas the, the term children was a, a, a term for affection, the term uh, sons or yos in the Greek, it has more to do with identity. What Jesus is saying here is happy are the peacemakers for they will be identified with God. It is in, in Beatitude number eight that we see Jesus shift from our formation as members of God's family to talking about the business that we as God's family members are to be all about. And what is the family business, you ask? The family business is peacemaking. The term peace to our 21st century ears um, conjures up a lot of different definitions and connotations, but it would not have been so in its original context because when Jesus, who was a Jewish rabbi, when he was speaking to a, an audience that was predominantly Jewish, the word peace would have conjured up one idea and one Jewish idea only, and that idea would have been shalom. Wherever you're at right now, listen to the podcast, just, just say that word right now, shalom. Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace. And as one biblical commentator noted, shalom, it, it is never only a negative state. Meaning that, that shalom never just means the absence of something. It never just means the absence of conflict. It never just means the absence of trouble or, or, or the void of war. But shalom has to do with, get this, shalom has to do with God's highest good for the world and humanity. It has to do with the expanse of human flourishing. It has less to do with a problem-free life, and it has more to do with experiencing what Jesus would later uh, call life and life to the fullest. Simply put, shalom is when we are experiencing life as God meant for it to be experienced. Shalom is when our minds are operating the way that God designed them to operate. Shalom is when our relationship with God and our relationship with each other are as he desires them to be. And it is that peace, it is that shalom that Jesus said his sons, his family would be in the business of making. The problem that our family business faces, however, is that the world around us, the world that we live in, doesn't naturally spin towards a state of shalom. And you know this, you, you already know that the world that we live in and the lives that we personally live, they don't gravitate towards God's highest good, but rather things gravitate very naturally towards disorder, towards chaos, towards pain, towards problems, towards trouble. Left alone, our, our relationships don't run into intimacy and stability or love, but our relationships veer very strongly towards dissension, towards disloyalty, towards envy, towards trust issues. Left alone, our, our minds don't migrate towards thoughts of truth, but our minds buy into lies of all kinds, lies about God, lies about ourselves, lies about others. Left alone, our bodies don't, don't, don't just get stronger and healthier by themselves, but our bodies break down as sickness creeps in. While the world began in shalom, when God first created it, that's Genesis chapters one and two, what did God say about the world that he created? He said, it is, it's good, it's good. He created mankind. It's, it's very good. While the world began in shalom, the presence of sin that showed up in Genesis chapter 3, sin jarred the world off its axis so that everything now spins away from shalom. And so, when God's highest good collides with a world going in the wrong direction, when shalom opposes this world's sinful orientation, shalom creates a conflict. It produces friction. Let's say it this way. Peace will pick a fight. Have you ever experienced this in your own life? 
where peace, this idea of your highest good, let's, let's say the, the good way of going about things, the right way, when it, when it collides with your life, it often creates conflict at first. One of the nuances of marriage that Jackie and I have yet to master in our five and a half years uh, together um, is, is figuring out how to give the other person um, helpful feedback when they are driving. No matter how we say things, no matter what we say, if one of us is driving and, and the other person provides any amount of coaching or, or caution, it is a surefire way to produce conflict, especially if one of us is driving and the other person says something like, watch out, or, or you should slow down here. And after years of, of trying to work through this and, and, and you know, trying to figure out different ways that we can communicate to each other um, and, and softening our words and figuring out different ways that we can word things, I, I have full confidence in saying that there is no hope for me and Jackie. This is just always going to be a point of friction in our relationship. And here's why. Because when I'm driving and Jackie corrects me, and, and she says something along the lines of, uh, you were supposed to turn left back there, and so now you need to pull a U-turn. While her heart is to get us back on track, while her heart is pure, and she just wants us to go the right way, she wants us to go the good way, she has no choice but to first conflict and oppose the way that I'm currently going. Cue the friction. As always, uh, the, there's no better um, person to look to for an illustration of peace picking a fight than the master peacemaker himself, Jesus, a.k.a. the Prince of Peace. Would it surprise you to hear that everywhere the Prince of Peace went, the Prince of Peace picked a fight? Everywhere Jesus went, conflict followed. In fact, in Luke 23, 5, when the religious mob was advocating before Pontius Pilate that Jesus be executed, here's what they said for their reasoning. They said this, he is, Jesus, is stirring up unrest among the people with his teaching. He's disturbing the peace. Everywhere, starting in Galilee, now all through Judea, he is a dangerous man. He is endangering the peace. They weren't all that wrong. Whether it was an incorrect ideology or theology, whether it was a physical ailment, whether it was demonic oppression, Jesus opposed, the Prince of Peace opposed whatever and whoever threatened the highest good for humanity. For instance, have you ever heard about the story about uh, Jesus clearing the temple? You could read about this in, in John chapter 2 uh, where it was Passover and so Jesus went to uh, the, the temple in Jerusalem to experience and partake in the Jewish festivities surrounding Passover. But when Jesus arrived to the temple, he found something that alarmed him. He entered the temple and, and within the court of the Gentiles, he found that there were animal merchants and money changers uh, set up there doing business. Now, um, a quick note note, Jesus was not alarmed by the business that was taking place. He did not have a problem with there being animal merchants. He did not have an issue with people exchanging money because um, Passover was a really, really big deal. And, and Jewish people would come from, from miles and miles to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And when they would get there, they needed two things. Number one, they would need to purchase animals for their sacrifices, hence the animal merchants. Number two, Jews would need to pay their annual um, temple tax at that time. And because there was only one approved currency for their tax, they would oftentimes have to exchange their foreign money for the approved currency in order to pay their taxes, uh, hence the money changers. Jesus didn't have an issue with the business that was taking place. What he had an issue was, was where the business was taking place. 
What Jesus did have an issue was, was he, he, he saw a problem, he saw a misalignment with God's desires was, was when he saw that the merchants and the money changers had moved their setups into the temple. They had moved their, their, their business into the court of Gentiles. The court of Gentiles was the furthest point for non-Jewish, a.k.a. Gentiles, to go inside the temple. It was where non-Jewish people could go into the temple and learn about Yahweh, connect with Yahweh. But when Jesus showed up to the temple at Passover, there were no Gentiles in the court of Gentiles because, because these selfish and self-centered and greedy animal merchants and money changers had not provided the Gentiles with any space to do so. And do you know how Jesus reacted? Jesus, he went in there and he, and he said, hey guys, very, very softly. He said, hey, hey guys, it's, it's good to see you all here. Love the way that you've got, you know, things set up here. The tablecloths, great touch, okay? Um, and I know you worked really hard to move all your stuff in here. And so I'm not about to ask you to move your stuff out. But, but hey, it is called the Court of the Gentiles and would love to create space for non-Jewish people to experience God too. Because after all, that's kind of why I'm here. As you'll find out, I'm actually going to create a way for all of humanity to connect with God. But not, <laughs> we'll leave that uh, uh, for later. Um, but right now, I was thinking, could we just all compromise a little bit here and Maybe just like move the tables together and make space for the Gentiles too. Because as you know, uh, my greatest desire is for everyone to get what they want. No, that's not actually what Jesus um, did at all. Instead, the Prince of Peace, you know what he did? He sat down for a few minutes and he, he bound together a whip, which then he literally used to drive out the animals, the animal merchants. He started literally flipping tables upside down, uh, 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 that then tossed the currency all over the place. As he said that you have made, you have made my father's house into a den of thieves. What, what was he talking about? What was he talking about? Was he talking about them stealing money or overpricing things? Some scholars believe so, but one thing is utterly clear is that Prince of Peace had a problem with people stealing other people's opportunity to connect with him. The Prince of Peace had no problem picking a fight. In another instance, um, Jesus uh, picked a little bit of a, a fight. He caused some friction with one of his own disciples, Peter. Later on in, in Jesus' life and ministry, uh, he provided the grandiose plan of salvation, of redemption for humanity. He sat down with his disciples, and he told his disciples what you and I always want to hear. We, he told them the plan. He said exactly how things would go down. He said, hey, in a little bit, I'm going to be turned over to the authorities. I am going to be persecuted. I'm going to be executed. But on the third day, I am going to rise again back to life so that I can reconcile humanity back to myself. And Peter was not so particularly uh, uh, excited about this. Because Peter loved Jesus and, and because Peter did not want to see Jesus, his friend, his rabbi, crucified and go through such persecution, Peter approached Jesus and he said, far be it from you, Lord, that will never happen to you. In other words, Peter turned to Jesus and he opposed Jesus and he said, I'm not going to let that happen. Not on my watch. And do you know how Jesus responded? Jesus leaned in and he said, hey, Pete, hey, come on over here. I understand that I troubled you. Man, let's just, let's talk through this. I, I, I'm, I'm starting to realize that I didn't bring you in on my plans and I didn't consult with you first and ask you, what do you want for me and for humanity? No, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, did not say anything like that. Instead, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, turned to Peter and said, Satan, <laughs> Satan, get behind me. Peter, you are, you are looking at things from a human point of view. You are not getting with God's ways here. And if you try to push your human perspective on me, I'm just going to have to say, devil, not today. Devil, not today. What I'm trying to, to communicate to you, mixed church, is that peace has actually um, very little to do with, with preventing conflict. 
So much uh, as it has to do with focusing on getting things and keeping things back on track. Making peace isn't merely about alleviating tension, but making peace is about bringing things back into alignment. Get this, y'all. Making peace isn't about protecting one's personal feelings or personal uh, perspective as it is about protecting the well-being and the highest good, God's highest good for the person hard pause real quick how how do you bounce back from being called satan (laughs) i mean can you just imagine how sheepishly peter walked back to the little disciples huddle after they all heard jesus literally call peter satan I, i just can't imagine him walking back and of course john coming over john and peter are good buddies and john coming over throwing his hand around peter and and saying hey man man it's gonna be It's going to be okay. And then at the same time, John looking over to the other disciples like, dude, God called Satan. (laughs) Dude, Peter, God called Satan. They're going to call me the one that Jesus loved. This dude, the devil. (laughs) How do you bounce back from being called Satan? I'll tell you, you bounce back. You bounce back from that moment when the Prince of Peace then goes on to pick a fight with sin and death and then utterly defeats sin and death in the grave by way of his resurrection three days later, which then reconciled all humanity back to him. That's how you bounce back, because the Prince of Peace picked a fight with our sins, with our transgressions, with with death itself in order to reconcile us and bring us back into relationship with him. And that's the key word here, Mix, as we are considering this idea of making peace, is that peacemaking is all about reconciliation. Peacemaking is all about bringing things back into right standing. It's about bringing things back into right order. It's about seeing relationships realigned with God and with each other. It's about creating shalom, God's highest good in a world gone sideways but make no mistake making peace will pick a fight in our efforts to make peace in this world there's going to be a friction that we're going to have to embrace in order for for the 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 greater conflict to be resolved conflict must first be confronted and that can be uncomfortable That that can be very, very unpopular. That's not always going to be well received. In fact, spoiler alert, but in a couple weeks, we're going to wrap up the Beatitudes. and, um, And Jesus is going to follow up this Beatitude where he's saying, blessed are the peacemakers. He's then going to go on to say, blessed are the persecuted. Now, why would Jesus say something like that? How in the world would we end up persecuted if we do beatitude number eight and we are peacemakers why because when god's highest good when his shalom when his peace confronts a world going in the opposite direction peace picks a fight and oftentimes it is our action of making peace in this world that results in our own persecution. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 10, 34. He said, don't get this confused. I didn't come to bring peace to this world. What, what, what do you mean by that? What Jesus was saying, I didn't, I didn't come just to like coddle the chaos here. I didn't come to say, hey, it's just, it's okay. You guys can stay the exact same way that you've been. You can remain in your sinful nature. It's all good. It's fine. Jesus said, don't don't get this confused. I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. In other words, my very presence is going to create conflict. When you let me into your life, it's, it's likely going to stir some things up because not everyone is going to be all in on what I'm doing in your life. The presence of peace produces conflict. Peace will pick a fight. And it's why we sometimes settle for the cheap substitutes of peace. There's many, but let's just talk about the main one. One of the main peace alternatives is appeasement. That this is when instead of making peace, we, we, we seek to uh, pacify the situation 
by then giving in to or bending towards the demands of the problem. Jackie and I, we, we constantly battle the temptation of appeasement in our attempts to parent and protect our two-year-old son, Ezra. Because, again, this may surprise you as well. As a two-year-old, Ezra is not so oriented towards the highest good for his life. And, and every single day, there is at least one interaction. I can think of one this morning as I was getting him ready for school, a.k.a. daycare, where, where our desire for Ezra's highest good comes into conflict with Ezra's two-year-old ignorance. And 99% of the time, Jackie and I engage and we make peace in the situation even though we know it's going to produce a two-year-old temper tantrum. I wonder who he gets it from. But... But the other 1% to 2% of the time when Jackie and I have had a long day, when, when we've had a lot on our mind, when we're tired, when we're worn out by the demands of life, there are times when we just look at Ezra and we just say, whatever, whatever, dude. You want to dance on top of the table with an open flame? Whatever, dude, it's fine. <laughs> Appeasement is what the Old Testament prophet uh, uh, Jeremiah was confronting when he said that there are people who say, peace, peace, when in actuality there is no peace. The 21st century uh, adaptation of that would be, it's fine, it's fine, but it's really not fine. It's when we say, hey, it's good, it's good, but it's really not good. It's actually quite bad and we say these things we speak peace peace when there is no peace all the time we say these things about our relationship with God it's good I'm good with God and then someone asks you about how things are going and they ask you hey what does your devotional life look like hey how often do you talk to, uh, to God how often do you lean into his scriptures and it's absence 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 but it's good it's good it's good it's like no it's actually not good we speak this over our relationships we speak this over our marriages it's fine it's cool it's good and it's not fine we speak this over our mindsets and we we say, ah, this is just the way that I've always been. It's good, but it's not good. And the reason why we do this, because we know that as soon as we say it's not fine and we embrace the reality of things, we are one step closer to actually making peace. And making peace will pick a fight. Making peace will cause some friction. And so instead we, we appease and we actually forfeit true peace, God's highest good, in order to pacify the situation. The message of Jesus in Matthew 5, 9 is not blessed are those who are easygoing. It's not blessed are those who get along with everyone. It's not blessed are those who never disrupt the status quo. The message of Jesus is happy are those who are willing to work for the highest good, God's highest good in the world and for humanity, even if it costs them, even if it produces some friction, even if it makes things more uncomfortable, even if it picks a fight. Peacemaking, y'all, is the family business. And so let me ask you right now, wh wherever you're at, whether you're driving home from work, I hope you've got a longer commute. I've been told many times that y'all got to start your message in the morning and then finish it up on the way home. And that's quite all right. But regardless of what you're doing right now, a couple questions. Um, if making peace is the family business, how is your branch of the family business going? Are you making peace in your sector of the market? Are you making peace or, or are you picking the wrong fights? Because you see, y'all, when peacemaking becomes our priority, it will expose who our real opponents really are. When God's highest good becomes the goal of our lives, it will illuminate what we need to pick a fight with. And so let me ask you it this way. Are you making peace in your relationships or are you fighting to protect the relationship at the expense of honoring the person and being honest with them? I struggle with that one. I've struggled with that one my entire life where where I will sense God leading me to be honest with the person, whether it's you know, pointing out the truth in love and telling them, hey, that's not God's best for you, or whether it's opening up and being honest with myself about a shortcoming of mine, and I will withhold the truth from them because I'm afraid it will risk the relationship. 
and I hold back peace. Are you making peace within your mindset or are you fighting to maintain the status quo in your mind at the expense of embracing God's truth? Depression, anxiety, mental illness of every kind, they are not God's shalom for you. But in most cases, in order for there to be peace in our minds, we have to confront the lies and the toxic thinking that we have been letting in. That's why Paul says in Philippians chapter uh, uh, 3 that God's peace, that passes all understanding, God's peace will guard your hearts and your minds. It is God's highest good that wants to guard us. But in order to experience his highest good for us, we have to allow him to speak into our mindsets and point out which things we need to get out. Which patterns of thinkings we need to eliminate? Are you fighting, are you fighting to, to make peace or, or are you fighting for your personal comfort and your convenience? And it's at the expense of introducing shalom to the world around you. When peace, God's highest good, when peace is the priority, it will reveal what is worth picking a fight over. And so as we close, I'd love for you just to spend a few minutes on, on your own just thinking, where does peace need to be made in, in my life? And three frameworks for you to consider. Number one is, is in, your, in yourself, in your mind, in your heart. Have you received and embraced God's peace that he has made with you by way of Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross? And maybe for some of you, that's your moment right now. It's just to receive that and say, I receive your peace. But in order for peace to, to be made in your heart, you've got to embrace the friction that it's going to cause because it is going to confront your sin. It's going to confront your failures. It's going to confront your sinful nature. And we've all got it. We've all got the orientation to mess things up. And you've got to embrace that in order for God to make peace in your heart. Or in your mind where you just begin to say, God, make your peace in my mind and confront any thought or, or, or pattern of thinking that I have allowed in. Second framework is consider your relationships. Is there peace that needs to be made in a relationship? Is there some honesty that needs to be given? Is there some truth that needs to be spoken? And the last one is, is there peace that needs to be made in, in the world around you, in your community? Or are you, again, fighting for your own priorities in life? But God is calling you to be a peacemaker. He's calling you to make investments in, in the community. He's, he's calling you to serve at one of the upcoming uh, I Love My Cities. What is I Love My City all about? It's about peacemaking. We are in our community trying to realign things and set things straight. But it will cost you your convenience. It will confront your calendar. He's calling you to make peace in the world around you. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for our time today. God, I pray that you would speak to every single individual who has heard this message, that this word would produce fruit in their lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in.